you know, I'd been exercising that entrepreneurial muscle and I exercise it every day for myself. And it's really fun because I get to help other people. This is what people pay big, big, big bucks for. And, and this wonderful and generous woman is here walking, going to walk you through these processes. So please watch this all the way to the end. You're going to get so much today. Hi, Susan. Hi, Anna. So nice to see you this morning. It is awesome to see you this morning. You are one of my favorite humans. So it's always oh, a delight wow. to get together. I have you here today as one of my permission to shift experts because you have such a, a unique approach to writing books that also really deeply applies to how we approach life. And the parallels are so uncanny and ridiculously useful. So I was hoping that we could focus on some of those processes and some of the things that you've developed over time to help your audience. Absolutely. I'm Amazing. all for that. <laughs> Amazing. Let's start off by talking about you a little bit. You have quite the interesting past and the interesting story, and it brought you to where you are today as a top 100 marketing master, which is really cool. So can you give us a little bit of a lead in, help us understand a little bit about who you are, and then we'll dive into that. Yeah, I, I will do that. And I'll see if I can do it very succinctly. So we have lots of time to cover the real, really juicy stuff here. But I do think it's important. And as I describe my background, I think most people who are listening, and I know you mm -hmm. will identify because all of the things that happen to us that we experience in life, and we make choices about how we handle those things in life lead to the next step, which then leads to the next unfolding, so mm. to speak, the next transformation. And for me, I was a very young widow, my husband, who was only 28, and my mother, who was 51, and I was 25. Um, they both had uh, different cancers, but within the span of each diagnosis um, and their passings, they were gone within, both gone within a year. I, from small town Pennsylvania. And the plan had been that when my husband was finished with his college education, I would get mine. And he was three credits away from graduating when he passed away. So I had lost the two most important people in my life. I, it was the life as I knew it was gone. And I had to take a step, a scary first step, but I took a step across the country to Southern California where I had heard and it was true that you could establish residency and go to college. So it took six months and I got a job and I will tell you, I never went to college because I fell into, um, I believe it's the, the way the universe works because I had the courage to take that step. I had the belief right? in myself that I was going to survive and do something with my life. And even though at the time, it really didn't feel like a courageous act, Anna, because I mean, I lost everything. What did I have to lose to try to go to a new state and try something new? But in hindsight, I know there was courage involved. And courage is a mainstay of, of what I'm going to share with you today. But I fell into selling what we knew them as microcomputers, uh, which, of course, we live with them now. But at the time, people thought of computers as being, you know, in banks, in cold rooms and, you know, key tape and mm -hmm. so on. So I was perfectly <laughs> positioned that um, basically all the banks and the securities market in San Diego bought from me. And then AT&T recruited me to come uh, head up there, what was called the National Data Sales Organization to represent the PC, um, even though they didn't care about it, they knew that that was a market share that got people in to buy their big voice computers and so on. The people who I had been selling the, the personal computers with, they said, Susan, we understand why you're doing this because you've had this chip on your shoulder that you didn't go to college, even though you're highly successful. And now AT&T is bringing you in at an executive level and we understand that you feel like you have arrived. And I did. But they said, you're not going to be able to stay because you're an entrepreneur. In the corporate environment, you're going to feel really stifled, inability to be able to fly. Um, and they were absolutely right because AT&T just clipped my wings. <laughs> so I had oh, the opportunity yeah. to go back to where I had been. 
but things were changing so much and now it was taking PCs and networking them. And to me, that was what AT&T brought to the table. And I thought, you know what? I really am not that interested in technology anymore. And it really had never been technology. It was more solutions. You know, what solutions can I provide to people? Which again, key point. Powerful, here. yeah. Key, key point. Um, and then, um, but I was running marathons and I would go into these early morning breakfast meetings at at and and they'd have greasy donuts. And I'd be like, wow, what I wouldn't give for a good brand muffin. And Mrs. Fields cookies were very big at the time. And I thought, I'm going to be the name of muffins. And so I opened up a ba bakery cafe called Little Miss Muffins. <laughs> Never had been in the restaurant business. Won't bore you with all the details there. But I grew that business to five locations, including the commissary, in two years. That brought me up to the Seattle area where I live now because I would come up to see what Starbucks and Seattle's Best was doing because nobody knew who Starbucks was yet. You know, so I came to the co coffee capital and would bring that information back. So again, leading edge found that it really was too massive for me to manage. And I thought about bringing in investors, but I just downsized. I sold the commissary, kept two of the most important ones in Belbo Park. And I had time on my hands and people kept saying, Susan, you should write a book. Tell people like, how did you do these steps? How did this unfold? And Anna, I couldn't figure it out because when you do it intuitively, when you tune in to yourself and your inner power, key point, we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know. It's like unconscious competence. You don't know what you're doing unconsciously that is a competent outcome. Mm -hmm. So I ended up writing The Land of I Can, which is a gift book. I know you have a copy of it that I had sent It's to so you. good. It's written on the basis of uh, children's books because I have collected children's books. So it's, it's distilled information. And I thought when I wrote it, women will buy this and it'll help them go through the lands of life mm -hmm. and arrive in the land of I Can where all things are possible and to recognize the power within themselves. And women will buy it and gift to other women, which did happen, but it took on a life of its own, which I could take the next hour and just tell you about that, the life of its own. But the bottom to the story or the end of this story, the point is that it was so successful that then people came to me who either wanted to write a book or had a book and had not been successful with it and said, how did you do that? So um, entered into the online publishing environment as in blogs, social media followed. Um, Cause uh, the Land of I Can was published in 2001 mm -hmm. and social media really didn't enter the marketplace until 2005, 2006, 2007. But I fell in love with online publishing as much as I did print, you know, traditional publishing. And that's what's brought me to where I am today, having worked with so many authors, either that I've helped write their books, or have helped them promote and position their books. And it's my passion. I couldn't ever have thought that that's that 25 year old girl, young woman in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, could ever have been doing the work that I'm doing today, but it was taking one step, having the courage, accumulating knowledge, information. Uh, the only reason I believe that Little Miss Muffins was so successful and grew as quickly as it did was because I had been an entrepreneur in another marketplace. Mm. So, you know, I'd been exercising that entrepreneurial muscle and I exercise it every day for myself. And it's really fun because I get to help other people, you know, and I've become a mentor to some very significant people in the world, which surprises the heck out of me, Anna, <laughs> but I have fun with it. <laughs> and with these people that you mentor, you're actually walking them through these processes we're going to be talking about today. Yes. Which yes. is crazy sauce. People, yes. I, I just want to bring our audience in on this. This is this is what people pay big, big, big bucks for. And and this wonderful and generous woman is here walking, going to walk you through these processes. So please watch this all the way to the end. You're going to get so much today. 
Where do we begin, Susan? Where do we begin? I believe the most important piece of the puzzle is clarity. And you and I have talked about that each of us have that gold living inside of us. And each person's gold is in a different place, just like a mar piece of marble where Michelangelo is chipping away. And, and that piece of marble that was David, the statue David, other, other sculptors had tried to use that mold and not been able, that piece of stone and not been able, so that it was uh, a bad stone. Mm -hmm. But he chipped away and he chipped away and he chipped away until he found the statue that we know today. And we have that inside ourselves so that the process is the golden idea mm -hmm. that when we get clarity about what our unique only me, like the story that I just told about myself, nobody has that story. That is right. my story. That is my life. Maybe people have experienced losses like I did, maybe some people experienced corporate America and liked it or didn't like it. Um, you know, we, we can see that different people might have comparative experiences, but nobody has that golden thread like I do. That's my life experiences that brings me to be able to help people like I do today. Mm -hmm. Each and every person who feels that they are a messenger, because not everybody feels they're a messenger. Yeah, that's but, important. But for those who feel they have a message, I knew I had a message. I People were telling me, Susan, you need to, to share your story. And I really didn't share the story in the book, but it gave me the opportunity to go out and do speaking engagements and talks and networking where I could tell my story like I have here today. Mm -hmm. It's getting clarity about what your golden idea is. Mm -hmm. And, and sh pushing away the things that keep you from, from having the power that's in that golden idea and that clarity. Because when we, we I know we've talked about imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. when we let those, those negative voices come in, it's really pushing away our power. Mm -hmm. And when we get clear about who we are and what we offer in the world that's different than what anybody else, in, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a CPA, that CPA is, he's doing it differently. He has a different philosophy. He has a different mission with the clients that he's working with. And once you get that clarity, that is your golden idea. Right. So like you're, you're on, you're a gobstopper basically, and you're trying to get rid of all that stuff to get to the, the part in the middle that's not going to break everyone's teeth off. So what are the steps? What's a step that we could take to start well, getting that clarity? A, a step is what are you passionate about? What do you talk about with friends, whether they're interested or colleagues, <laughs> whether they're interested in the topic or not, but you are just feel compelled to be able to talk about it. You find whatever that topic is that you're sharing or that philosophy or that idea, and you just want to explore it and talk about it. You're passionate about it. That's what you are a messenger about. That's where you get the clarity. It's not complicated. It's not like you have to go write a thesis on this. Mm -hmm. It's really what are you passionate about? And within that passion, chipping away to say, oh, I do think about that differently than somebody else. Then that's your hook. That's your angle. That's where you begin. And then you start to develop an outline for the book and you start flushing out the, the content that is within the book. Mm -hmm. So those are multiple steps, but the most important step is what are you going to put your stake in the ground for? Okay. What is it that you want to share with the world? And again, you and I have spoken about this on other, uh, we did this on the masterclass recently, is that you don't need to write everything you've ever done in your life. Mm -hmm. Like the land of I can does not have all of my life experiences, as I explained to mm -hmm. you, you just have to cover the main point. What are you going to stand for? Mm -hmm. And there's most likely going to be other books, right? But you don't right. have to put everything in one book. And in fact, you don't want to put everything in one book because you want to put out that one main idea 
really get that. It's your credibility piece. It's your platform building piece. You get known for that one idea. And then there's a follow-up idea and then a follow-up idea to that. So it will continue. And, and that's a good thing, mm -hmm. but you don't try to put everything in one book. Well, let's dial this back just a little bit. I'm let's say one of our listeners is looking for clarity and they look out your first step was find what you're passionate about. So for me, that would be neuroscience and psychology and communication and interaction with humans and, and, and how do I know which one of those particular threads is, is what I want to bring to the world when I have so many different, if you will, points of reference? Well, number one, when we put the stake in the ground, we are making a commitment. And even though creativity flows around us, we don't go there. We okay. stay with the stake in the ground. Okay. So we have to be willing. We have to have a willingness to put the stake in the ground and not stay out here. Like, should it be this? Should it be that? And then once we put the stake in the ground, we have to be committed to it mm -hmm. and not flounder again and go, oh, gee, all the Ooh. doubts are coming up. And I have a list here I'm going to read. I printed it out because I didn't want to forget everything. And I, I keep a list of all the things that I've heard people say. Ooh. And I'm going to read that. Yeah, I yes. think you're going to really like that. <laughs> but, but when you put that stake in the ground, you have to stay with it and you have to see it through. Because again, if there's five things, well, then you pick one and then that's your first book. And then the follow-up book is maybe the second thing or perhaps the third thing. However, having said that, Anna, I have a suspicion that you could put all of the things that you just outlined with your unique take in one book nice. because for you when i hear you talk about neuroscience and i think leadership was in there if yeah. not because i i know leadership you you are such a good model of that oh, um thank you i think all of those things fit together okay and that is your golden idea because you do have a unique perspective this is fantastic. you just have to be willing to put the stake in the ground and say okay i'm going to do it have you heard the position stand peter docker talks a lot about it where you you stand your stand is what you the goodness that you see in the thing that you most care about versus a position being a firm you're against something and the difference being that if you take a position yes, i have heard yeah now that you're i have heard him say that and i do agree with that so when I say stake in the ground, it's really because a lot of people aren't grounded. Okay. They're very creative and they stay out. And I'm creative, but I'm also very grounded. Mm -hmm. And so I know for myself, when I have an idea, it's a, I have a list of ideas, <laughs> but, but it's like, which one has the most juice <clears throat> or are there a few that come together? And, and how do you know? Have, you tune into yourself. You know inside you, you just doubt yourself. Interesting. You have that answer. We all intuitively, in fact, the land of I can says the power is in the knowing. You have to be willing to say, this is what I know is true. And this is what I'm going to choose to share. And that's what I call a stake in the ground. Okay, so that is in essence your stand. It is. Really? It is. is. And it's your stand for today. As you grow, your stand may expand. Right. Absolutely. Your stand may shift. But it's where you are today because the knowledge that you have today can and will make a difference for other people. Let's talk about when we're putting that stake in the ground, the fear that you you just mentioned three different things there you talked about our inability to commit so a fear of maybe not getting the right thing or not trusting ourselves our fear of commitment abs you that you nailed all three yep and there's a like i said i'm going to read a list here but there's all kinds of demons that come up and it's your job to get clear to get the clarity of who you are and what you want to share and put on the blinders for all the, the demons 
that are going to crop up. Help us with the, the blinders after you're done telling us about the demons, because I believe yeah, that is yeah, very yeah. useful. Stuff. Well, here, here's something. Um, you know, a lot of people that do the kind of work that I do are called book midwives. I don't care for that term, but it is, if you Google it, you will find a lot of people and uh, it's with good reason mm -hmm. because when you are writing, then publishing, then promoting a book, you are birthing a book. You are giving birth to that information. And just like every baby that's born is unique, every book that is born is unique. And the process is painful. It's messy. <sighs> it's not easy. But it's going through the birth process, which is where I say the commitment comes in. You have to have the commitment because it's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And you are going to run into demons and you are going to run into roadblocks. And the only way you're going to get around that is, it, is to access that inner power, that inner knowing that you have something to share and, and it's worth something to not just to you, because it will help you in your business and your positioning and your credibility, but to serve, to help other people. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I'm working with somebody, I'll say, write the book that you wish you would have had 10 years ago. Boom. Because I mean, each one of us have, have gone on our path in life and we've gathered important information and it's come through the lens of our experience and we have something to share. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's, it's wiping away the imposter syndrome that is normal. I had it when the books finally arrived and I'm pulling out, uh, got the box open and I'm pulling out the first copy of the, the land of Ikean. I was, I was struck with who am I to put my name on this book because I felt like it, it was like channeled information. Like it just came to me mm -hmm. and I was like, who am I to put my name on this? And then I looked at it and was like, well, who am I not? You know, I have a, a website called messengers on a mission because I do believe the people that I work with are messengers and are often on, on a mission, but that's the term messenger came to me in that moment. Like, okay, I am the messenger. I have received this information and as the messenger, I'm willing to deliver the information. That's so it's powerful. really stepping into your power mm -hmm. and anything else is just noise. That's going to keep that from happening. Right. It doesn't feel like noise though, because it fit it physically manifests as gut rot and all kinds of crap. Brain fog is really, some people get really tired, overwhelmed. Like it physically well, manifests. I, yeah. And I do think, Anna, that's why there are people like me in the world that often you need a coach. Yeah. You need somebody who can get you through the bumps and around, you know, or over the mountains and down into the valley. Um, I'm working with a woman right now who we have gone, we've gone over the mountain and she's doing well, but we had some mountain climbing to do. She did really well for the first couple of months we worked together because she's in a one-year plan, mm -hmm. but she did really well initially. And then she got to a certain point with a book where she just completely stalled and she right. began to question herself and she began, she, she was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And what I shared with her, and I think is important for everybody who's listening to, to this recording is that it's your information that's important. The writing of it has to get down in a draft format that's a clear outline that you, you know the points that you're covering within the outline. And then very often it's the job of the editor to get it in a good readable flow. You know, you don't have to have gotten a degree in journalism or been writing and consider yourself a writer in order to write a book. It's the content that you're bringing. It's your unique perspective that you're bringing. It's something that's going to make a difference in someone else's life. So leave mm -hmm. that work to the editor. Which is, again, the, the, whether you're writing a book or whether you're birthing an idea or whether you're birthing a company, these things are, they're the same things. You need the mentor and the community. I can't even, I can't agree with you more. 
having the mentor and the community and the we talked about this on the master class actually and I would love for your insights a little bit deeper because we didn't get to go into it as much on the master class we talked about how important it is to surround yourself with people who are one step ahead of you yes who've been experiencing the same mud and the same doubt and the same fear and they so you trust them because yes. the, the, your peers, you don't necessarily trust them. They're going through the same thing and you're like, eh, I don't, I mean, I like you, but mm, don't know. And we outgrow peers, don't we? Yep. You know, so, so yeah. growth is not, any kind of growth is not easy. I mean, I love nature. You know, I live on five acres. This, I'm in the upstairs of the barn. Um, it was where my office is. My home is across the driveway. And um, so I'm around nature all the time. And when you see um, a tree that's just a little seedling and it's popping out of the grass at the very beginning and it's starting to grow, it's really straining to get enough sunlight and it's straining to get to the point that it can birth its first leaf, you know? So, so we are nature, you know, we're going to grow. And um, the question is, are we getting enough sunshine? Are we getting enough moisture and rain? Are we getting that from other people who, as you said, are one step ahead of you or maybe 10 steps ahead of you yes. but someone that has gone down that road and can make the path so much easier for you you know i walked the camino de santiago five years ago and there's so many wonderful analogies there but when you're walking the camino some people do it in a group i did it by myself but when you're walking the camino sometimes there are people that are in front of you or behind you and sometimes you're on the path all by yourself and there are markers, supposedly, when yeah. you come to a fork in the road, but often they've been covered up with, with brush and growth and you don't see the marker and you have to make a decision. Am I going to go left or am I going to go right? For me, I just tuned in, went the direction that I thought and didn't second guess myself. And lo and behold, there would be a marker up front that would say, okay, you're there. Wow. So we have to be willing to trust that the universe has our back mm -hmm. and the universe is there to support us. And the people that have done it already, as in I mean, like I could give people who want to walk the Camino so many tips now because I've done it, but it's being willing to learn, being willing to be committed because you certainly have to be committed to walk 500 miles. You have to be committed and you have to know it's not going to be easy. There's no simple process. Like I cannot give you a simple process that says, oh, just follow ABC and you will write a book because the process of writing the book is a transformation process for you as an individual. Okay, we, we know this as people, we know things aren't easy. We know health isn't easy. And, and I can, I'm gonna get some pushback on that one. But in context, there's enough unhealthy people out there. It's suffice to say, it's not easy. A lot of things aren't easy. Business isn't easy. This is whatever, name it. And yet pills and Insta fixes, and I get a thousand Instagram ads a day for the ultimate five-step fix guarantees that it's going to work and change my life every time. We know it, but we don't listen. Why don't we listen? That we don't listen to the fact that that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know because people want the easy button. They want the easy button. And quite frankly, as you can tell from my conversation here, I don't promise an easy button. I do promise that it will be one of the most worthwhile things you have ever done for yourself as an individual and for your career to write a book. Mm -hmm. But you have to go into it with eyes wide open and committed that you're going to do the work and know that when you have to climb a mountain, you climb the mountain. And when you can coast down the other side, you can coast down the other side because you, you scaled the mountain. It is a process. Do you think the easy button is another form of fear and lack of commitment? Because if it's an Absolutely. easy button and it's cheap, I don't, I don't have to finish it. I can excuse myself out of it. The easy button has a lot of really um, unfortunate aspects to it. You're right. One of them is it can be a throwaway. The other one is, um, I'll do this because it's easy. 
And then when I don't get the results, well, then who cares? Because it, it only costs $47. You know, it's, yeah, it's um, an excuse. It's an excuse. Yeah. Like you've basically an left the door to failure open so that you could take that route out whenever it got hard. Yeah. And to me, anybody who chooses, I mean, I think we've all chosen the easy button at least once. Never. I know I have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have, you know, I'll buy a program because it promises in, in eight weeks, you're going to be able to do X, Y, Z, and it's something I want to be able to do. And so I buy it and I consume it and it didn't. And I'm disappointed, upset that I got caught in, because I, I could really get on my high horse about marketing because I am a marketer. I know. But I'm a conscious marketer, you know, and marketing can be used because they, we can appeal with copywriting. Mm -hmm. We can appeal to people knowing what their pain points are and we can get them to buy but is that really the uh, authentic thing to do if we're really not going to deliver if you're going to buy a course or you're going to use a mentor or you're going to do anything where there's a financial commitment and a time commitment then just look at what the results other people have gotten from going through that process it doesn't mean you'll get that because we don't know, you know, whether you will be committed and whether you will do the work, but at least, you know, the process, I know my golden idea process works. And I have people that have gone through it multiple times. One of my clients were finishing up his third book right now. So, nice. yes, you know, so, so I know it works. And in fact, one of my one year clients, who's a very well-known person in, in the direct response world he was in a one-year program with me and we did his his first book and when i started my group coaching program he came in for that and i said rick why would you want to be in you know my process and he said because i need the accountability and i want your insight right right you know so it is part process and it's part guidance from somebody who can see at a thirty thousand foot view what you can't because you're in you're in the muck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk about that list you have. Yes, and I have then it. Fact, I have it right jump here. into some of these core details because we can we can talk forever on these yes. topics. I want to make sure people get all their good juiciness. So I'm going to read this kind of slowly. It'll probably take a few minutes because it's a long list. No problem. But just for you and for anybody who listens to this recording, look where the juice is. When I read it, where do you feel flagged? Ooh. Okay. Um, not enough time. Not now. I'm too busy. I don't have that much to say. Too many books in the world already. No funds. It's too much work. It takes too long. Hard to find a publisher. No one ever told me I should write or publish a book. I can't write. I don't know how to write. I've already spent too many hours in front of my computer and don't want to add more by writing a book. I'm afraid I can't do this. I'm afraid there's no book in me. I'm afraid I don't have anything to say. What if I'm not an author? Who am I to write a book? I'm afraid my book idea isn't original enough. I don't think I have anything new to say. Everything I have to say is stuff everyone already knows. I'm afraid this has already been said. My book won't be any different from other books on this topic. I'm afraid my book won't be good enough. I'm afraid my book won't be perfect. I'm afraid I put too much in it. I'm afraid I didn't put enough in it. I'm afraid I'm going to forget everything I want to say. I'm afraid of leaving things out. I'm afraid no one will care about my book. What if no one reads it? What if there is no audience? What if my book doesn't impact anyone? 
What if this is a waste of my time and effort? I'll be embarrassed if people criticize my book. I'm afraid my book will upset people. I'm afraid this book is going to make somebody mad. I'm afraid of being judged. I don't want my book to upset my current clients. I can't say these things about people. What if my friends read it and hate it? What if I sound bitchy? I'm afraid my book will make me look stupid. I'm afraid I'm going to look stupid. What if I get all one star reviews? What if everyone who reads it hates it? What will, th what will people think if there's a typo? I'm afraid something will be wrong with my book and I'll look stupid to everyone I know. Aww. Did any of those jump out at you? Yes, a bunch of them jumped out at me. A lot around, interestingly, energetically, I felt it when there were, there's a lot of books on my topic already. What do I have to say that's any different? Mm -hmm. But part of me knows what I say is different because of who I am. There it is, bingo. That is, I mean, I could give feedback on every single one of these and it would take far too long to do that. But I just want you to know that everything I just read is demons in your head. Everything I just read is 100% untrue. 100% untrue. And it, it's just your, not you, but it is, it is an individual's inability to put the stake in the ground, to claim their power and say, I'm going to do it anyway. But we are biologically programmed to not piss off the people in our circles. And if we're afraid that our book is going to shake up the foundations on which we're standing, that is a that is a terrifying conversation to have with yourself. It's it's between you as an individual acknowledging who you are and what you have to offer the world and you as an individual having a tribe and you feel like you have to choose. Well, but maybe there's a new tribe, Anna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe your existing tribe can't accept what you're saying, yeah. but there's a whole new tribe out there waiting for you. Yeah, people have that. I feel like that's something people have a hard time with, though. Mm -hmm. Getting walking into the unknown is from an evolutionary standpoint, pretty much death. So that's what we're grappling with. We're grappling with our fear of death. Well, absolutely. In fact, I've often said to clients, what's the worst thing that could happen? And they go off and they say different things. And I said, you know, the worst thing that could happen is you die. Yeah. That's always, it's the survival. The worst thing that can happen is that you die. And anything prior to the, writing the book will cause you to die, which again is ludicrous, but you face that fear. Mm -hmm you know, that lizard brain and you face that fear and you say, okay, well, if I'm not going to die, everything else, just wipe it away because it's whether we listen to it, we may be hardwired for it, but we still have a choice. We always have a choice whether we move forward or whether we stay stuck where we are. Yeah. And it's that moving forward, taking one step, deciding that you're going to do uh, write a book, that you're going to do the project, that you're going to be committed to it, that you're going to work through in any issues that come up around writing the book. It's mm -hmm. the commitment that you bring to it and the willingness to know that stuff will come up, mm -hmm. but you just don't let it stop you. I was just going to say, because it would, just like I don't like the easy button, it would be an incorrect statement to say, you will never have any problems when you write your book, Anna. You, it's going to come out like butter. It's going to flow. It'll be perfect. You'll have it published in three weeks. That's all garbage. Everybody who has ever written a book has gone through hell and back. But when they do it, they transform not only who they are, they come out the other side with something that is so unique and so, because I, I don't believe any of us are given messages from the universe, from God, from whoever you, you know, is your higher being. We don't get that idea unless we're meant to do something with it. 
And whether you choose to be that messenger and do all the shitty things you have to do along the way to make that happen and face the demons. I mean, it's the hero's journey. The hero goes out on a journey and they face the demons and they succeed and then they, they come back and then they go out and they do it again. And the transformation happens. That is what happens when somebody writes a book, but it is so worth it. It's interesting you talk about the hero's journey and, and we've discussed this before, but one of my programs that I do with people is we walk them through their own hero's journey in a very structured way, but we we do, we mine the experiences and through that, they actually come to realize a little bit more that clarity piece that you're talking about. Yes. Oh yeah, I have these skills. I have, this is my signature skill set. This is my market. This is, it's all the stuff they know, but they didn't know they knew it. Exactly. It, they, they get little epiphanies. Yeah. You know, it, so the epiphanies are like, oh, yes, I really do know how to do that better than anyone I have ever met. Or yes, <laughs> I do do that differently, but we're too close to it. That's why they need somebody to guide them through. And it's amazing the surprise, the surprise that that thing that I do every day without thinking about it is a skill. And it's because we do it so naturally that we don't, we don't place value on it. But truly that is, you know, I started the conversation when you said, how do you know where to start? And I said, it's what you're passionate about, Mm -hmm. but another piece of that, you're passionate about it, but you also do it and it's easy for you. It's easy. I love that. What do you do without thinking about it? That's just inherently easy for you. What comes out of you? I like that. Yeah. And once you help people and they have that clarity and we we've done that process, the fear of being seen, I would have to say is one of the biggest things that repeatedly comes up, repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. comes up. Yeah. It comes up for me. It comes up for my clients. It comes up with experts. It comes yeah. up with newborns. It comes up. Well, not with newborns, I guess they don't care if they're seen. They're glorious that way, but just about every other human on the planet. How do we get past our fear of being seen? Well, I, again, it's how important is it? And it, I'm an introvert. I really don't like being visible. I'm not somebody who's doing Facebook and Instagram lives every day. Somebody who is an extrovert by nature will want to have the camera on them and be visible. But for those of us who are more introverted, we don't want to do it. You know, it's, it's just, I like to be behind the camera not in front of the camera. I like to help people. I don't want to be the one that's visible. And when I finally came to the realization, and and I've been very, very lucky, Anna, in that through all the years that I've done this work and with people writing their books and publishing their books and promoting their books, it's all been been based on referral. Mm -hmm. Somebody knows somebody who's worked with me and and I they've come to me. And then a couple of years ago, I realized I'm not helping enough people. I'm only helping the people who are coming to me. What could I do if I became more visible? That's where the courage comes in again. What is your mission? Who is it that you want to help? And are you willing to overcome not wanting to be visible enough that you can reach more people and serve them? And I, I did, I was never a road warrior um, as a speaker, but I did do speaking engagements for about two years at the point that I had published The Land of I Can. Now that we live in a virtual world, um, I mean, we can, we can speak just like, you know, I spoke at your summit. We can speak and stay right in our cozy own world and our own environment. Um, But it wasn't always like that. But I chose not to go out on the road anymore and to focus on the up and coming internet, quite frankly. And what could I publish as a blog? What could I publish on social media? And that's how I gained my visibility. We do live in a time where being visible is easier Mm. than it was prior, where the only time then was to go out and do a book signing or speak on stage somewhere. So we have these lovely ways now that we can be visible in whatever ways we choose to be. That's fair. And once we are over, we're clear, we're over, well, we'll never be over our fear. We're just leveling it up. We're leveling up every time. What what more can we 
look at what's our next challenge. Ta let's talk about the outline. Yeah, well, it really comes down to once you have that, that stake in the ground, that one big idea, then what is the flow? If you were going to sit down with a colleague and explain your process or your information, where's the beginning, the middle, and the end? I call it going on a journey. Going If, if you are going to start in Seattle and drive to New York, yes, there's point A, it's the beginning, point B is the end, but what are the steps in between? Am I going to stop in Utah? Am I going to go south to Colorado? Are you know, going to go the northern route, the southern route? There's a lot of different ways to get from Seattle to New York, but we have to be clear about our destination. And then the outline is just the points in between so that we can be congruent with the information that we want to share. And we don't want it to be convoluted. We want the people who read our book to consume it. We don't want them to read a portion of it and set it down and not pick it back up again. Mm. So the outline is the most critical piece. And once we get, and again, it, it's clarity. It's not easy. It's not like somebody sits down in five minutes, writes an outline. <laughs> it's a process, believe me. And <laughs> it, there's changes like, oh no, there's an extra step. I didn't think about that. Or, you know, uh, I like to see five to seven chapters but you can write a book with three chapters. You can write a book with 12 chapters. It really comes down to how much information are you putting into this book? And like I said, I like five to seven. And then you just start writing a draft of the chapters within the outline, just a draft, just to make sure it can be even bullet points or, you know, and that's what an outline is, right? Yeah. So you're creating an outline of what is going to go in that particular chapter and you start pulling information. You know, if you have journals that you've written about and you go, oh, this, what I said here in the journal would work really good in chapter two. And this is going to be the, you know, the context of chapter two. So we all have things that we can pull from. And also we might want to do research. Uh, if it's a topic that's something that other people are talking about, we can say, um, Mr. Smith from XYZ University recently did a study and talked about blah, 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 you know, but the containers are there in the outline. And then you're gathering the information that's going to go within those containers. At that point, you have your rough draft. At that point, you know the journey that you're going to take people on. And you know the stops along the way and what they're going to see, feel, hear, and your stories. I hope everybody that is listening that wants to write a book keeps a story journal. You won't, re you won't use all of your stories in your book. You might use some of them in the book and some of them for social media. But when you have a story journal and you're, you're going through these containers, you can pick and choose and say, oh, that story about when I experienced XYZ would go really well in chapter five. Oh, this story that I have of me when I was a child and it formed my outlook on what, you know, the topic that would go really well in chapter one, but it's a, it's a plug and play. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I've never actually thought of having a story specific journal, obviously a journal and a gratitude journal and those kinds of early morning exercises that we all do and proven and all the rest of it, but a story journal, that's really oh, awesome. Uh, yeah. A story journal. You can pull from that for website copy. You can pull from your story journal, like I said, for social media, and you definitely want to have a story in each chapter. And that story needs to be relatable to what that story is, because think about when you talk, we, we, mentioned earlier, we as humans are hardwired to think a certain way. Well, we're, we are hardwired for stories and people will remember the stories that we've told in our book. And that will help them remember the point that mm -hmm. you were making, but they'll remember the story first. It makes it a lot less like a clinical diagnosis of a paper. Too. Yeah. I mean, because the kinds of books that I help people write is not academia. It's, it's as far away from academia as, as possible. I want short sentences. I want, you know, to the point. 
there's a lot of you know tricks of the trade type of thing but again short short chapters short sentences make it more consumable also oh, want people to to consume our information mm -hmm. so a five to seven chapter book you're talking like 100 130 pages then not exactly. 200 exactly exactly ah. exactly in fact i saw the launch of a book today um i'm not sure how i feel about it because it's getting some press um but it's only 50 pages I don't know how it can even have a spine. It's got to look like a pamphlet, quite frankly, unless they've filled a lot of, they, they could have filled pages with photos or quotes um, and there's no interior view. Like if you go to Amazon and you, you do the look inside, there's sometimes in a look inside, you can see all oh, the chapters are only, you know, two two pages long or something, you know? Yeah. But um, but I can't get the the, grip on what this book is like and I'm tempted to buy it just so I can see it but it's Let only me know. 50 pages it's only 50 pages but my ideal is 100 100 to 150 pages is something that people will read mm -hmm. they'll consume it it's it will get your message out if you're clear that's why you can't put everything you've ever learned in life in it that's interesting unofficial this is just me and the people I hang with a lot of people stop reading at the 100 to 150 pages. Exactly. Mark. It is amazing how many it of us is. do that. I have literally on the go right now about eight books that are somewhere between the 150-ish pages where I've stopped. Exactly. Thank you. That's really amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You've just, you know, validated um my 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 process. Initially, when I started working with people, I wasn't familiar, I wasn't concerned with pace page count. I just was concerned about the information that was in the book. But we're on overwhelm. Yeah. We're in a different place now than 20 years ago. And people want to be able to get the information, the reason they bought the book, they want to be able to get it all and get it fast. That's why the short sentences, short chapters, 100 to 150 pages. Could you even take, say I wrote a book and it was uh, 300 pages. Could I just break that into three books and sell it as a box set? And then people are like, Ooh, well, you digestible. could as long as there's a beginning and an end. In right. other words, each each book should should be consumable. OK, I hear you. You know, it, yeah. If you just leave somebody hanging at the end of the first book because it didn't have a beginning, a middle and an end, they're not going to want to go on. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I feel like if you know enough to write 300 pages, you should be able to take any of those chunks and say, OK, here's a here's the story of this particular portion of the work. Yeah, I mean, when I cannot tell you how many times I get um, a rough draft from a client who is just meandered on and on and on and on, and they could have said the same thing in three sentences that they said in three paragraphs. Typically, a book can be if, if they're not working one on one with me, because sometimes I just get the manuscript and then from there, help them. Um, and those are they're very bloated. Yeah, you know, and we'll, we'll get something that's like 100,000 words, and we got to get it down to 50,000 words, like we're cutting it in half, whereby if I'm working with someone from the very beginning, that doesn't happen because we never get into that bloated stage and we stay really on topic. Right, right. There are, at, after you do your outline, and I know there's just a few other things in there, can we quickly laser run through the rest of that process and then give out all of your contact info so anyone who's listening to this, because we, we, we don't have time to go into too much more detail detail, but yeah. we'll definitely hook you up. And guys, anyone who's watching this who really wants to write a book book, Susan's your your girl, and we're gonna have all of her links down below. Well, her link, link. <laughs> link, yeah. And um, the uh, booktypequiz.com yep. is great because I've created four avatars that help you understand what type of person you are, what hurdles you will run into, and what type of book that you should write. So. That's also a, a good um, beginning point yeah. uh, is to do the, the book type quiz. But I will say that once you have your draft done, there are a couple other pieces 
of the puzzle. One is an introduction, which some people would say, oh, well, don't you write the introduction first? And I say no, because of all the things that we've been talking about, that outline and the pieces of the puzzle that are within the outline, they morph and they grow and they change. And once you have it in place, then you write the introduction, which is the guide of what people are going to receive, learn in it. But you can't write the introduction first. I don't believe that. Then you also want to write a conclusion. And the conclusion is just almost the, the reverse of what the introduction is, but a reminder of what people have received and how they can reach out to you and what other um, offerings you have. And the final piece is to request somebody uh, to write a foreword of your book. You need to have the introduction, the rough draft minimally, if not the edited version, and the conclusion so that the person knows what you're writing about. And the best thing that you can do is find somebody to write the foreword who is known within your industry. And as you were saying earlier, is one step ahead of you or five steps ahead of you, a recognizable name. Be willing to accept if they say no and go on to the next person. Have a list of people have like your number one, this is who I really, really want. Okay, here's number two, here's number three. So that you don't just have one person and you're betting the farm on that one person and then they find and you go, whoops, now what? Mm. So have a list, know that the universe will supply multiple people for you. And it's just a matter of you choosing who you approach first. And then if you need to go to the second or the third, and I can tell you that so often when people are declined first, cause they're reaching big, they're reaching for a big name and the big name isn't willing to do it. And then they get down to the second or the third person. And it's actually the perfect person way better than what it would have been with the first person because the person either gets more engaged with the author about the book, um, is willing to promote uh, to that person's influence about the book where the big name wouldn't have been willing to do that necessarily. So make your wish list of the forward, be willing to go through the list and know that the perfect person will be there. And it's just it's a great credibility piece for your book. And it also adds more content to your book. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Susan. It has been delightful to have you here today. Guys, reach out, get in contact. She is absolutely a delight. Thank you so much, Anna. And I'm going to keep after you until you write that book. Put that stake in the ground. <laughs> I have put the stake. I have 50,000 words written. They're just a humble mess right now so <laughs> well do an outline as we've been discussing and then plug and play what you have into that outline that is amazing thank you susan mm -hmm.